recorder. Okay. Okay. Um, good morning and good evening. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's uh, APHRS Education Webinar, Pacing Module, Part 2. My name is Jeremy Yu. I'm the Regional Education Manager at Abbott Medical. It is my pleasure to be the moderator of this session, together with my colleague, Patrick Ho, the Senior Regional Education Manager. Today, I'm very glad that we have four experienced speakers to share their knowledge on pacemakers. They are Professor Huawei from Beijing, China, Dr. Sukima from Malaysia, Dr. Anil Sasena from India, and Dr. Kevin Tra from Singapore. If you have any questions wanted to ask our speakers, please type your questions into the chat box. We will have time for Q&A after each presentation. And when you see the polling questions on your device along the presentation, please respond with your answer. For those um, who have attended Pacing Module Part 1 two weeks ago, after today's section, you may apply for a certificate of attendance from the APHRS. Please provide your name and email address to APHRS Secretary or through Abbott's webs. So now I would like to introduce our chairperson, Professor Hui Hua. Professor Hua is a professor of cardiology, deputy director at Cardiac Arrhythmia Center, Fuwai Hospitals, and Cardiovascular Institutes of Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences at Peking Union Medical College. He is now a service as president elected of Chinese Society of Pacing and Electrophysiology and chairman of Cardiac Pacing Committee of Chesby. Hi, Prof. Wang. May I invite you to deliver an opening message? Thank you. Hi, Professor Wang. Can you hear me? Hey, Ting Tao. Uh, um, could you please help to uh, give an opening message? So I think um, 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 there is uh, some internet uh, connection uh, issue with uh, Professor Hua. Um, um, so we may um, come back to Professor Hua uh, later. So um, now I would like to um, introduce our first speakers, uh, Dr. Su King Ma. Um, Dr. Ma is a consultant, cardiac electrophysiologist, and a regional key opinion leader in the field of electrophysiology. He has been frequently frequenting uh, various um, regional cardiac centers as an EP proctor since 2014. Professor has received many uh, training from uh, many places, in, uh, such, uh, including uh, from the U UCLA Cardiac Arrhythmia Center uh, in US. And Dr. Ma is also the past chairperson of Malaysian Heart Rhythm Society. Dr. Ma is going to share his um, uh, knowledge on timing cycle and pacemaker. Thank you, Dr. Ma. Thank you, Jeremy. A very good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us. So when I received the invitation to speak about basic pacemaker timing cycles, I was very excited because it's one of the topics that is, I'm very passionate about. And although it may seem very basic and very fundamental in the beginning, but as you will see later, it is incredibly sophisticated. So let's get into it. I've nothing disclosed. The outlines are like this. I'm going to lay out the pacemaker knowledge preambles for you first, for you to be able to understand the layout of what is a base, basic timing cycle is. Now really, I want you all to understand that timing cycles are all about the rotation of clocks inside the pacemaker. It's about clocks and ticks inside the pacemaker. Later, I'm going to talk about the pacing codes and some nuances on the timing terminologies that we as fellows in the beginning, we are all really, really worried about. 
um, I'll close that up with some case scenarios in the, in the end. So the preamble, the very important two pieces of information we need to get ourselves understand is a pacemaker only does two things and that is all full stop. Number one is to pace the patient, of course, as the name implies a pacemaker. And number two is to sense cardiac electrical activity. And that's about it. And the pacemaker does these two things over and over and over again at a programmable intervals until the battery itself has been depleted. And the keyword here is really over and over and over. It sounds like a broken machine, I know over and over and over. That is exactly what a pacemaker does, essentially. We program the intervals. So with these two words, over and over and intervals, comes to this, time and cycles. Look at this, like a clock. For example, if you have a clock that starts with zero ticks, it ticks until five ticks. And along the five ticks, the pacemaker is always looking for these two things. Have I detected something or haven't I detected something? I sense something or I sense nothing. So in the case of sensing something, usually that means that the pacemaker need to initiate another internal clock, another timing cycle. In the case of they sense nothing, means there's no cardiac electrical activity. Usually at the end of a cycle, the pacemaker will deliver a stimulation spike to pace the heart. These are the fundamentals of it. And these are the really the very basic and also at the same time in the beginning it may be nuances for a lot of uh, uh, starting early career fe fellows. So about the pacemaker nomenclature, the codes here. The first alphabet of the code means which chamber has been paced. It can be a ventricle, it can be the atrium, or it can be both the ventricle and the atrium. V, A, or dual D. And the second alphabet of the code means which chamber has been sensed. In the same vein, it, had, it can be V, ventricle, A, atrium, or D, dual, uh, dual as in both a atrium and the ventricle. The third alphabet here is if the pacemaker picks up the intrinsic cardiac electrical activity, what do I do about it? Response to sensing. They can be T triggered or I inhibited, or in some cases can be dual, both triggered and inhibited. Now, this is one of the things that uh, I think it may require some understanding. Why can it be triggered and inhibited at the same time? It doesn't make sense. It's like saying yes and no at the same time. We'll do more about that in a while. And the fourth alphabet is about R, rate modulation. I will talk more about that in a while as well. Let's go to the most basic of all, the basic of all pacemaking codes that we can have. We all started our career with this, understanding V, V, I. Now V, the first alphabet, alphabet is which chamber has been paced. In this case, it's the ventric ventricle. So it's a single lead system, single chamber system going to the ventricle. It paces in the ventricle and it sends in the ventricle. Now, what would I do as a pacemaker? If I sense an intrinsic cardiac electrical activity, I inhibit myself. I means I don't, don't pace. I inhibit myself. Now, this is very easy to understand. Second is D, 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 dual chamber pacemaker system. First alphabet means which chamber has been paced. In this case, it's both the atrium and the ventricle. And second alphabet, which chamber has been sensed? Both atrium and ventricle. Very easy to understand. Now, here comes the hassle bit. D means both the response to sensing is both triggered and inhibited. What you're talking about is yes and no. It's because of this. If you have the intrinsic atrial sense activity, atrial sense means that you detected intrinsic activity in the atrium you need to be triggered the pacemaker because you need to initiate another internal clock timing cycle called the AV interval. So the clock will ticks until it times out and it will look for 
cardiac electrical activity or initiate another clot. In the same vein, if let's say the, pay, the, the event in the atrial level is pace, atrial pace, it will initiate, triggers another clock called the AV delay timer <coughs> or the so-called pace AV. How about in the ventricular level? If in ventricular level, if you detected a intrinsic cardiac electrical activity, you inhibit yourself. That's why it's dual, both triggered and inhibited at the same time. That's why the letter D in the third position. Hence, in summary, we have a lot of other pacing codes. You can use the same concept to decode all these uh, different iterations of codes. AAI means pace in the atrium, sense in the atrium, and if you sense an intrinsic activity, you inhibit yourself. VVI, I spoke about earlier on, DDD I spoke about earlier on, and VDD. Now, VDD is a single lead, dual chamber, actually, single lead system, whereby it can sense both the atrium and the ventricle, but only paces the ventricle. This is a very special form of pacemaker. Now, among all these different forms of uh, pacing modes, I want my fellows to understand that the commonest form of pacing mode that we employ in day-to-day -day practice is going to be DDD because it can treat a variety of indications of radiarrhythmia. One thing is about knowing the codes, what does it mean, VVI, DDD, and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, it's about deducing the codes. Now, this is one of the key knowledge an EP fellow should have at the outset. Now, one thing is about knowing the codes. <clears throat> you see the codes, what does it mean? Deducing the codes is another matter. Let's dwell into this. Before deducing the codes on the surface ECG, I want you all to know two rules of thumb, extremely important. If you know these two rules of thumb, it will make your life much easier. Rule number one is, if you are faced with a ECG of a patient implanted with a pacemaker, you can assess the pacing function of the pacemaker only, only when there is a pace beat, and this is a fact, you will not be able to tell the pacemaker function without any pace beat. In the same concept, in the same vein, we can assess the sensing function of that pacemaker only when we see an intrinsic beat. If you see the pacemaker or all pace beats, excuse me, we are unable to assess the sensing function. Then that's the basic fact you need to take away. Let's do some mental exercise because in my time is in the morning. So let's do some exercise here. Let's look at this rhythm strip. And I've made this very easy for you because I've already annotated all the events here for you. So you can see there is a pacing spike which follows a QRS complex, means capture of the ventricular myocardium, followed by a T wave, so ventricular pace. And after interval, certain interval, there's another spike with ventricular pace. So already we know the first alphabet must be V, at least. How about the atrium? We do not see any atrial pace event here. What we see, intrinsic P wave here. So the first alphabet must be a V. Second alphabet means which chamber has been sensed. Now we can deduce that. Again, we are fortunate to have an intrinsic QRS complex here. Now, if you guys look at the middle, it doesn't seem to affect the interval at all. So it's not been sensed, this QRS complex. And the P wave has not been sensed at the same time as well. So the second position is going to be O. If it's O, then the third alphabet must be at O because uh, there's no sensing activity here. So this is a, one of the famous pacing mode that we use as asynchronous pacing for diagnostic purposes. How about this one? Slightly more complex here. <clears throat> 
Well, you have a ventricular pacing spike here that causes a Q QRS complex capture. And how about, so the first letter, which chamber being paced, should be at least V. But how about in the atrium? In the atrium, you see intrinsic P wave, but you don't see pace P wave. Oh, so the first letter, the first alphabet here should be a V. How about sensing activity? You see that there's an intrinsic QRS complex here. Let me pull out my laser pointer, yep, here. So it has been sensed here. So the ventricle has been sensed. How about the atrium? Yes, the atria, the P wave has been sensed as well, initiated a AV interval, hence, the second letter here is V, dual, both in the atrium and the ventricle. What are the response to the sensing activity? Well, you can see here the sense activity. If you are in the ventricle, you are going to be inhibited. If you're in the atrium, you're going to initiate another timing cycle, AV interval. So it's going to be dual, both triggered and inhibited. So the answer is V, D, and D. Let's try another one. This one is kind of the favorite of all. You see the pacing spike followed by a capture in the ventricular level. And at the same time, you see a pacing spike followed by a capture at the atrial level. So both the atrium and the ventricle has been paced. So the first letter is D. How about sensing activity? Yes, the ventricle is in sense at the same time as well as in the atrium. So the second letter also a D. How about the response to the sensing activity is both inhibited and also triggered. As you can see, the initiated a timing cycle, the AV interval here has been triggered in the atrial level and inhibited at the ventricle level. So it's D, D, and D. One more, purposely taking away the annotation marker here, is for our audience to have some mental exercise. What is a pacing mode? So this is a polling question for my dear audience. Shouldn't be a challenge to most of us. We give the audience about 30 seconds, right, Jeremy? All right, good. So majority of uh, my audience said is uh, D, D, and D. All right, let's do some work here. Okay, what is the pacing mode in this strip? Now I've uh, enabled the annotation for you again. The first alphabet means which chamber has been paced. So obviously the ventricle and the ventricle level has been paced. So a pacing spike followed by a QRS uh, complex. How about the atrium? The atrium has been paced also. So the first letter must be a D dual, both in the atrium and the ventricle. How about sensing? Now look here. The atrium has been sensed. Definitely, there's a P wave here. And the QRS has been sensed as well, here. So the second alphabet is a D. Third, alpha, third alphabet means what is the response to sensing? Now, look very closely here. The P wave here has been sensed, but it does not initiate a, an AV interval. So it means that at the atrial level has been inhibited rather than triggered. At the ventricle level, we know that it has been inhibited. So the third alphabet should be an I. So it's DDI mode. 
Now let's talk about these uh, four modes of DDD pacing. I think along the my career, I, I read about the four phases and the four modes of DDD. I never quite get the idea of this until actually I got into practice. <clears throat> we, it's extremely important for us to know that when we put in this, the commonest, the most famous form of pacemaker system for the patient, we need to be cognizant of this fact. There are four possible morphologies that we can get from that patient. When you implant that pacemaker and do ECG on the patient, the first possibility is A sense, B sense. Means that the pacemaker does not do any pacing at all. So the pacemaker does not pace, hence the patient is on his own. So the ECG will appear entirely normal, quote unquote normal, because it's all intrinsic cardiac electrical activity. So P wave, QRS complex, all intrinsic. So it can happen. So I'm, I'm sure it won't happen that often now, but 10 years ago, I still, you know, 10 years ago, 10 years ago that time I was still a senior fellow. So still nurses will call you after a dual chamber that, hey doctor, it doesn't seem to be pacing. The, pa the, the, patient, the, the patient hasn't received pacing yet. So pacemaker this malfunction, something like that. Now it has happening less and less, but we need to be aware of this. So this is possibility number one. Possibility number two is A pace V sense, means that we pace in the atrium at the sense in the ventricle. Possible because the pacemaker does two jobs. Number one is to sense and number one is, number one is to pace, number two is to sense. If you sense intrinsic, I won't pace the patient. So number th third possibility is both pacing at the ventricle and the atrial level, A pace and B pace. And number fourth possibility of course is A sense and B pace. Hence we must know these four phases or four modes of DDD pacing. The fourth alphabet or fourth letter here, the R, whether with the R, with, without an R, I shall not be able to point too much because uh, there are a lot of different technologies, uh, which is proprietary to different brands. But suffice to say that it means, simply means that if you have R, the pacemaker is a smart one. Smart in the sense that it can be able to afford more physiologic pacing experience for the patient because the R means rate responsive pacing. The rate that we set in a pacemaker will, be a, will go a, according to the patient activity. For example, it's running at a time, the pacemaker has got a sensor, it's sensing that the, the patient is moving, so we'll be pacing the patient at a faster rate. So as uh, so simply put, it's a smart pacemaker. Terminologies, a lot of them, we need to talk about sensing, pacing modes, the lower rate interval, escape interval, and so on and so forth. But guess what, I have good news for you. We have done two, so a few more to go. For dual chamber, a bit more nuances here because we need to talk about upper track rate and far field sensing and crosstalk in a moment. Now I need to <clears throat> um, talk about this is in one sentence is not the, the, the gist of this talk, but then we need to be cognizant of this. Dual chamber pacing definitely provides more AV synchrony, which is more physiologic. So if you talk about single chamber pacemaker, there's only one indication for single chamber pacemaker in, in the world, chronic AF with complete heart block. If you want AV synchrony, you need to put in a dual chamber. Now, analogous to a clock operates in ticks, pacemaker operates in milliseconds. Also ticks, but the ticks is in milliseconds very fast. Now this formula as a pacemaker fundamental learner, we need to understand this. One minute equals to 60,000 milliseconds. So if you wanna talk in the language of pacemaker, you need to talk not in bits per minute, but in milliseconds. How to convert that? Easy. Take the number of bits per minute, divide it over 60,000, and then you get the milliseconds that you want. Okay, timing cycles. 
we have done a lot. But just to add on the layer of knowledge here, so this is a single chamber system pacing at the ventricular level. You have the lower rate, lower rate interval here, means the pacemaker clock it ticks when it runs out without detecting any cardiac electric activity, it will deliver another pacing spike. This is called the pacing interval. For me, it is just another term is a bit semantic here. If you sense an intrinsic cardiac electric activity, V sense here, and you time out the clock ticks until the end, there's no more cardiac electrical activity, you deliver another pacing spike. Now this interval we call escape interval. It's quite easy to understand. What makes things a little bit more fun is this. Every time the pacemaker deliver a pacing spike, a pace, a stimulation, a pace, pacing spike here, there will be another one or two internal clocks being initiated. What are these timing cycles or internal clocks? One is called the blanking period here. And another one is in blue here is called the refractory period. What are these? Why are they there? Now imagine if you miniaturize yourself and go into the cardiac chamber and be looking at their pacing lead. When it pays, it's like a flashlight shining in your face, blinding you. You couldn't see. It's better for you not to see because it's very blinding flash here. It's like the whole area in that cardiac uh, chambers has been filled with thunderstorm or flashlights. So, if so, then you better have a blanking period. If not, then you will saturate your sensor up to a level that for it to recover, it may cause a problem. So the blanking period is designed so to protect the pacemaker from seeing for that very moment. After I deliver a spike, I stop seeing, blank myself for a short period of time. And then after that, there is a refractory period. Now, why do we have a refractory period here? Now, these are words here simply because you want to prevent inhibition by cardiac or non-cardiac events. Because if you deal with a pacing spike, there will, be, there will be a saturation of the sensor and there will be decay in the signal. And for that period of time, the sensor may still be able to detect their own pacing spike, so to, call, so to say, pacing spike. So stimulus evoke our wave. This is, a, this is a term for that and repeated sensing of the same intrinsic R wave and more so T wave. Why T wave? Let me illustrate for you. Now look at this uh, rhythm strip here. You have got a ventricular pacing spike with a capture cause a QRS complex. There'll be a blanking period in the beginning because the amplifiers have been saturated. You need to switch off for that short period of time, blank it let it go blind for a short period of time. And followed by a ventricular refractory period, means that now I open my eyes, I see, but I don't react. Just now, I just, I don't want to see. I don't see, don't react, just now in blanking. Now I see, but I don't react. But I jot it down. I record for my implant, for my physician to see for the implanters. So ventricular refractory period, a period of time which sense events are ignored for timing purposes, but are included in diagnostic counters. So you still can see in the diagnostic counters. So the pacemaker will ticks for a thousand milliseconds, thousand times, tick, 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 until 1000 milliseconds, not sensing anything, you deliver another pacing spike and initiate another ventricular blanking period here, and the cycle continues. Now, it takes for 1,000 milliseconds. Before the end of 1,000 milliseconds, something happened. The pacemaker picked up an intrinsic cardiac electric activity from the ventricle, so ventricular sense. Same, ventricular sense initiate another ventricular blanking period, 
and ventricular refractory period here. Now, I want you all to look at this. The T wave is falling into the ventricular refractory period. Now, at that moment, the pacemaker still be able to see the T wave as in a cardiac electrical activity. Now, rem remember that a pacemaker will not be able to tell which is Kira's complex, which is a T wave, because they can only see electrical activity as in a spike. So, what if they mistaken this as a, another ventricular uh, event, as in a QRS complex? If without the refractory period, if we initiate, set the timing cycle again, say that, oh, there's a QRS complex here, so I inhibit myself, V, V, and I inhibit myself. So the patient will be left with a long pause if not for the refractory period counter here, which is crucially important. Now, those are timing cycles for single chamber. Now, before you thought that that's the end of it, you said, oh, oh that's the end of it, okay. No, dual chamber refractory periods are more complex. I've uh, wiped out a lot of uh, these uh, refractory uh, intervals for you, for you to see one at a time. As you can see here now, you, may, you are expert already on ventricular blanking and ventricular refractory period here. So no worries. Okay, you still can take it. But if I tell you this, now the ventricular channel here not only has refractory periods or blanking periods for the ventricular level, but lo and behold, we also care about what happened in the atrium. Makes sense or not? Now, in, a, in my early career, um, when I was still a very bustling young fellow, so it, it doesn't make sense to me because why should the ventricular channel, the ventricular leak cares about what happened in the atrium? Because it should be doing its job in the ventricular level. Now, very important because when what happened in the atrium can determine what happens in the ventricle. So, when the atrium has an event happen, either a pace or a sense event, there will be a post-atrial ventricular blanking. Means that now, okay, I don't want to see for a moment also. And for ventricular channel, there is this period here, very, very peculiar period called the safety window here. I shall talk about it more in a while, but just for the, the time being, just move on and talk about other things. In the atrial level, lo and behold, there are more events, but let me break it down for you in an easy way. In the same concept that, of course, in the atrial channel, I should care about myself, right? When there is a atrial event at a P wave or a pace <coughs> P wave here, I will have atrial blanking period for sure because I care about myself at least, but I do care also what happened in the ventricular. So we call it a post-ventricular atrial blanking. Something happened in the ventricle, I blank myself for a while, and at the same time, I have a refractory period. Now, let me ask my dear audience, how are they taking this? <coughs> Paul, why do you think that we need all these post-events blanking and refractory period across different chambers? It's not only in the same chambers that you care about yourself, you care about others' chambers as well. <coughs> So you have numerous periods here, numerous uh, refractory periods and blanking periods here. What are the reasons? Number one is just for EP fellows to crack the heads so that EP exam is so difficult to pass or to make EP more mystical, like mysterious feel. No? Third is to prevent the chambers from talking to each other. And fourth, sounds like right one, for doctors, patients, and everyone's safety. Can it be wrong, right? So please poll. <clears throat> so we have 10 seconds for the poll. Yeah. Sure. Wow, very good. I have a very exquisite audience here. Let's move Let's on. Move on.
The reason why is <clears throat> traditionally we talk about the heart has been like four chambers, two upper, two lower. The upper chamber called the atrium, the lower chamber called the ventricle, right? They're all separated apart. <clears throat> like upper and lower, we don't care about each other, right? Except in the middle, which is connected by the AV node, his bundle. The truth can never be far from that. Look at this. The right atrial appendage, which is the usual place that we put the atrial pacing lead here, is right next to the ventricular alpha tract. So if you have a pacing lead there, doing their stuff, pacing, causing cardiac electrical activity at that spot, they'll be whispering, talking across the wall towards the ventricle. And we call it crosstalk. Crosstalk is the thing that we need to avoid in pacemaker because you cannot let what happened in the atrium interfere with what been detected in the ventricle. That's why we have all this refractory and blanking period here. Now, let's talk about a bit more about this special window here, very special. Now, ventricular safety pacing. Now, what are these? Now, imagine you have the atrial pacing event here and it saturates the sensor in the case of, and it initiated a period called the post-atrial ventricular blanking in the ventricular level. Now, this is a cross chamber. And this is a special window here called the safety window, whereby if I see anything within this window, instead of saying that I ignore this, I don't do anything, now I do something. If I see something, I will paste. Why is that so? Now this is especially important for those patients who are dependent on pacemaker at the ventricular level, for example, complete heart block. If you have an event detected at the ventricular level, although it falls into the ventricular refractory period, it must be handled with care because if you see it and then you think that this is just another intrinsic cardiac activity, which you ignore, you may, at the end of the refractory period, pick up another signal that initiate another timing cycle so the pacemaker won't pace at the ventricle level. As you know, if the patient is pacemaker dependent, this will be catastrophic for the patient. So you need to know the safety feature of majority of pacemaker. Again, across all brands, they have this. <clears throat> Why is that so important is uh, for EP fellows also, for cardiology fellow and EP fellows, sometimes they see this. So why is that the AV interval seems erratic? It's like all over the place, some very narrow, some very broad. It's because of VSP, ventricular safety pacing. Because VSP across all the brands, they have specific interval. I believe for Medtronic is 110 and for Abba is 120. So, if you see the pacing spike becoming, <clears> the <throat> two pacing spike becoming shorter, narrower, and wider, the narrower is because of ventricular safety pacing, which is around three small boxes here. Now, upper tracking rate is another term that we need to understand. To put it simply, upper tracking rate is used to prevent in the event of atrial tachyarrhythmia, the atrium is beating very fast, the pacemaker is trying to catch the rate of the atrium. Now, if you catch the rate of the atrium and pace in the ventricle in the same way as in atrial fibrillation or atrial tachycardia, that could be catastrophic as well. As I always amusingly tell my fellows that, just imagine the pacemaker is like accessory pathway. If you know, do not program it properly, it can behave like an accessory pathway that conducts down to the ventricle in almost one-to-one -one fashion. So the upper tracking rate is designed to prevent that. Which brings me to this mode, the DDI mode is non-tracking mode, which is the mode that we should switch for the patient if the patient has got very fast atrial rate in the beginning of the implant. And you may think that, well, well, we keep on need to readjust the mode of pacing for the patient. In fact, no need. Nowadays, with modern pacemaker, they all have autom automatic mode switch, which will do the job for you most of the time. You switch in and out of pacing modes from DDD 
to DDI non-tracking mode for you. Let's see some case before we end the session. So a 65-year-old man with hypertension, symptomatic 600 syndrome, been implanted a dual chamber pacemaker. You pull out this event strip as follow. So pay attention to that to maybe 30 seconds or so and tell me the diagnosis. Paul, please. All right, very good. I think a lot of our audience are either EP fellows or electrophysiologists, yeah. So let's walk through this. Let me bring up my laser pointer here. So in the atrial channel, you have two spikes here. So it's two spikes means uh, two signals and in ventricular channel, one signal. You look out in the marker channel, you see A sense, A sense. And you quickly realize one thing though, the second ascents always line up with the ventricular channel here. So what's going on? So what happened is, this is so-called far field sensing. Sensing of signal which is not supposed to be sent in that chamber. So intrinsic activity is sensed in the wrong chamber. And you can see here, it always sends the atrial channel always sends the QRS complex, which is happening, should be happening in the ventricular channel, but they pick up as a signal in the atrial channel. This looks like a two to one <coughs> connection here. How to overcome this problem? Now, in the interest of time, I just move on. Uh, we skip the poll here, is to increase the PVAP here because you need to increase the atrial channel blanking period so that it won't sense the signal which is happening on the opposite chamber here. The answer is PWAP. Now, why not decrease the atrial channel program sensitivity value? It's the opposite. You should increase the value. You increase the value, you decrease the sensitivity. It's a bit counterintuitive here. Increase the value. Yeah. Let's move on and go to the final case here. 60-year-old lady with computer block. He had a dual chamber pacemaker implanted on follow-up. She complains to you, I have palpitation all the time, doctor. Last time I have uh, bradycardia. I have syncope, but now I have palpitation. You saw this. And 30 seconds, quickly go for the poll. Let me go back to the strip for you all to see. Nothing normal, just some sort of tachycardia. Or you think we have switched the lead. The A in the V header or the V and the V lead in the A header, which happens, uh, hopefully not so often in our practice. Oh, really good. Wow. Pacemaker has become an accessory pathway. Ladies and gentlemen, that is absolutely correct. Now what happened here is pacemaker pacemaker mediated tachycardia. Now what happens here is A sense and down here V sense, but there is a PVC, another V sense here in the ventricle, which conducts up to the atrium retrogradely and been picked up by the atrial channel as a sense event. Hence, sense means I initiate another internal clock. Timing cycle caused the AV interval. And when it times out, there's no ventricular cardiac activity, I will pace in the ventricle. And guess what? The pacing activity captures the ventricle and causes another retrograde conduction. And the cycle goes on and on and on and on. Boy, was it like a re-entrant circuit? Was it like an AV re-entrant tachycardia? So I always, in an amusing way, say that the pacemaker has become an accessory pathway. So to prevent the pacemaker mediated tachycardia, there are a few strategies. Now, it, it is more like a jam nowadays. You hardly can see it. Off, I mean, I, I still see it, but then you hardly can see it because the pacemaker has been so advanced that they have their own algorithm to handle that. If indeed it happens in your patient, you program a longer PVAP, post-ventricular atrial refractory period, 
it will settle that. Or in some pacemaker models, they have so-called pivot after PVC, which can handle this problem at the same time. Now, this is a very complex diagram. I just want to draw attention to here. So this is a PMT in the cooking. But because of this intervention here, PVAP extension, this particular retrogradely conducting P wave, atrial depolarization, has been fallen into the refractive period, hence will not be counted as an event and the cycles will be eliminated. So take homes, ladies and gentlemen, pacemaker is nothing but a clock with various internal clocks. So nothing to fear about this. Pacemaker can only do two things, can only pace and sense. <clears throat> All the various timing cycles interact with one another. Blanking effective peers are designed to prevent crosstalk. We have a special feature called ventricular safety pacing. It's very important for patients whom are dependent on pacemaker. And PMT, again, is a relatively uncommon jam, but they've often been asked in EP exam and also in uh, other quiz. So be mindful about that. With that, I really thank you very much for your kind attention. I will give the floor back to Jeremy. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Ma, for your uh, teaching. So uh, understanding of timing cycle can help uh, in managing uh, pacemaker patients. And actually, Dr. Ma obtained a certification of cardiac device specialist, as well as a cardiac EP specialist from the IBA Chow Yi. Um, hi, Professor Hua. Do you have anything you would like to add to this topic? Uh, I think uh, uh, it's very important for time cycle. Uh, it's uh, very important, but not easy to talk and explain. So uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Mark, for uh, very clear explaining the time cycle. And this is very important for uh, further understanding of a pacemaker uh, model and the pacemaker <coughs> work. Uh, because the uh, time is uh, limited, so I think we should move to the next uh, speaker. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Ma, again. Thank you. So, uh, next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Anshia uh, Saxena. Uh, doc <coughs> Dr. Saxena is an international acknowledged uh, expert in the field of uh, cardiac arrhythmia and uh, electrophysiology. Since joined the uh, 40s Escort Heart Institute in 1989, Dr. Sinclair has been actively involved in setting up the Department of Academic Physiology. He's one of the pioneers in implantation of ICD and bioventricular pacemaker in India, and has one of the largest experiments in this field. Dr. Sinclair is uh, currently the president of uh, India Heart Rhythm Society. Uh, Dr. <coughs> Saxena today is uh, going to talk about the pacemaker troubleshooting simulation. Uh, so Dr. Saxena, please. <clears throat> Dr. Saxena? Yeah, good morning everybody. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be with uh, all of you here and I hope you can hear me. And I hope that all of you as well as your families are safe during this difficult period of pandemic. I will be talking about pacemaker troubleshooting and uh, share some cases with you that we encounter the problem that we encounter in our daily practice. And Dr. Ma has given an excellent talk and some of the material will be uh, overlapping, but he has definitely made my job easier and uh, the question that I'm going to ask will be, it will be very helpful from his talk that you can answer them easily. Now, the pacemaker malfunction can occur because of a variety of reasons. There could be hardware failure. And usually it is the lead that phase. Pacemakers usually don't have much problem. They're very robustly designed. But lead is the weakest link. And uh, they can be inappropriate programming sometimes or there can be some change in the underlying native rhythm, which uh, uh, makes us feel that the pacemaker is not behaving properly, or sometimes it can lead to a change in the pacemaker function itself. It is important to understand that the ECG changes can sometimes be very subtle or they may be absent. And early recognition of a pacemaker problem or, uh, is very essential uh, because we can do appropriate programming or change the hardware and that can be 
life saving for the patient now the problem with the pacemaker can be uh, related to the output failure or there can be some failure to capture the output may be there but may fail to capture uh, otherwise there can be uh, sensing problems and uh, it could be both under sensing when the pacemaker fails to sense a supposedly to be sensed intracardiac signal or there can be over sensing where it is sensing something inappropriate which could be intracardiac signal or it could be something outside the body it could be some electromagnetic interference with the pacemaker senses and it starts malfunctioning sometimes the pacemaker can cause dysrhythmias as uh, dr ma gave an excellent example uh, it could be pacemaker mediated tachycardia and sometimes there may be pseudo malfunction which we perceive as malfunction but actually it is some complex algorithm at work and sometimes two algorithms may interfere with each other and produce a pattern of ecg which is very difficult to unravel so uh, there are many examples of pseudo malfunction as well so i will be asking questions in between this is just a test question all of us are expected to know the answer to this question so uh, uh, i can just uh, activate the poll here and please make your choice whether it's a pacemaker sensing failure or loss of capture or pacemaker mediated tachycardia or automatic mode switch thank you so all of us uh, know that it's a pacemaker uh, loss of capture we can see that there are pacemaker spikes which are not capturing so i will not waste time on this electrogram this was just a test electrogram so going to the uh, first case so we have the case of a 16 year old boy with congenital complete heart block who was implanted with a dual chamber pacemaker and he presents to the pacemaker clinic with complaint of discomfort and lightheadedness when he exercises on pacemaker interrogation everything is okay pacing threshold sensing and lead impedance everything is normal on x ray the lead position remains normal unchanged so we decide to recreate the scenario by using the treadmill test we create the scenario of patient's exercise so what do we see here uh, uh, this is the ecg during treadmill as soon as the heart rate increases there is some abnormality in the in the heart rhythm the rhythm becomes irregular and with further exercise there is a fall in the heart rate so uh, please indicate what is the problem that the patient is failing we can launch the poll here uh, is it intermittent pacing failure or it was sensing failure or intermittent ventricular tachycardia or upper aid behavior excellent so uh, it is upper aid behavior as dr ma has already explained beautifully uh, that we in every pacemaker dual chamber pacemaker we have a lower rate and we have a upper rate and in this example we can see that the upper rate tracking rate has been programmed to 130 so uh, when the pacemaker yeah so when when we put the patient to exercise the heart rate gradually increases and as we can see on this screen also that the maximum tracking rate is 130 and as the uh, pacemaker as the patient exercises and the heart rate increases up to 120 we can see that there is one one to one conduction but as the heart rate goes beyond 130 patient is expected not to continue to increase the heart rate but but the pacemaker develops a pattern of uh, a kind of wanky back so we call it pseudo wanky back because it is happening by the pacemaker and the heart rate remains fixed at 130 so the pacemaker tries not to increase the heart rate beyond what we have set up as a upper tracking rate so the, there will be progressive prolongation of the av delay till the p wave will be dropped and as the heart rate increases further a rate will come when the patient will develop two to one av block so that is called top rate as has already been explained so this is the problem that the patient is facing and we can see here that there is a progressive uh, prolongation of the 
uh, the maximum tracking rate is 130 and there is progressive prolongation of the AV delay till 1P becomes a refractory because it falls within the postventricular atrial refractory period and uh, it becomes AR that is atrial refractory and not be uh, acted upon. So the pacemaker will try to maintain the heart rate at 130 which is the upper tracking rate here. So this slide shows, this has already been shown by Dr. Ma and uh, we can, in the upper panel, we can see there is one to one AV conduction. In the lower panel, we can see that uh, there is the upper rate response, which is pseudo vanke back and there is progressive prolongation of the AV delay by the pacemaker till one P wave comes, which is, which falls in the refractory and that is not followed by a ventricular event and the next P wave is again tracked and, and followed. And when the heart rate increases further, every alternate beat will fall in the atrial refractory and the heart rate will drop. So this is called fall down rate. That is to two, when the patient develops two to one uh, rate response. So this slide shows beautifully how the heart rate behaves on exercise in a dual chamber uh, rate response pacemaker. We have, uh, this is the lower rate. And when the patient exercises, the heart rate gradually increases. And re when it reaches the upper rate, uh, there will be a Wenke back plateau. And finally, when the atrial rate reaches the top rate, then there can be a sudden fall in the, in the heart rate. So that may be called the fall back rate. So uh, we need to program the, in a, this was a young man, 16, 17 year old boy. So we have to program the AV, we have to program the upper rate to about 150, 160, 170. But at the nominal settings of AV delay, and of the PVARP, that may not be possible because uh, these things, they consume a time in the cardiac cycle. Uh, AV delay about 150 to 200 millisecond, and if we program the PVARP to about 250 to 300, so total may become around 500. That limits the upper tracking to 120. So we have to somehow decrease these AV delays. Now, uh, it may not be possible to reduce AV delay all the time. And the P warp also, if we reduce too much, then there may be other problems. So now we have in almost all the pacemakers, we have a function called rate responsive AV delay, where the AV delay becomes shorter uh, as the heart rate increases. And that actually mimics the normal heart function. We all know that as we increase our heart rate, the AV delay gradually shortens, the PR interval shortens. And the same thing can be programmed uh, to be mimicked by the pacemaker that with increasing heart rate, the pacemaker will shorten the AV delay and that will allow a higher tracking rate. And the same thing can be done to the PVP warp as well, that at low rate, the P warp is longer, but as the heart rate increases, the P warp may reduce and that will allow higher tracking rate. So that's how we can program. So this patient can be programmed with a shorter AV delay that is medium, and uh, rate responsive, so the minimum AV delay will be about 100. We can program the P warp also to uh, automatic rate responsive P warp, and the shortest P warp can be programmed to 175. That will allow a tracking of uh, 160 heart rate, and and we can see when the patient exercises again, uh, patient has one to one AV delay, one to one uh, conduction uh, or response, then there is no, then the problem is solved. Now coming to case two, which is a 60 year old man who was implanted a dual chamber pacemaker for complete heart block with normal sinus node function. The patient is asymptomatic and came for routine follow-up and, and came for dobutamine stress test. Uh, and there were no symptoms for last uh, few months. Device interrogation is performed during the stress test because in dobutamine stress, we sometimes have to increase the pacing rate by the, device, by the programmer itself. And this is what we find during the dobutamine stress test as the heart rate increases beyond a point, it suddenly drops. So uh, what is uh, this uh, that we are dealing with? Uh, we can activate the poll here. The choices could be AT causing, atrial tachycardia causing automatic mode switch. It could be atrial bigemini. It could be a far field R wave sensing. It could be atrial under sensing. So I want the audience to take a poll. Excellent. So uh, most of you have uh, 
correctly diagnosed it as a far field R wave sensing. Dr. Ma beautifully showed how the uh, ventricular signal can sometimes be sensed in the atrial signal. So we can focus our attention on the atrial sense channel and we can see that there are two spikes. Now at a lower rate, it may not matter that much, but as the rate increases and the count doubles, it may reach the tachycardia detection rate. And whenever, as soon as it reaches the tachycardia detection rate, uh, the patient will have a automatic mode switch. So we can see that the automatic mode switch is on, it is programmed to DDI, and there is auto and tachycardia detection is set at 220. So whenever the heart rate reaches around 125, the patient will go into uh, automatic mode switch into a DDI mode. So that's something very, very important to diagnose. And even more important is to, is to prevent it because we can prevent this uh, kind of uh, thing ha from happening if we take adequate care at the time of implantation. So that's how uh, it looks like on the, in the real time. We can see that the atrial channel shows uh, two spikes, which when, as the rate increases, uh, the count will double. So as soon as the heart rate reaches around 125 because the tachycardia detection is 220. So as soon as it reaches that, we will have a fall in the heart rate. Now, uh, it has already been explained to you and how we can uh, solve this problem. So as Dr. Mai explained that there is an interval called PVAB, which is post-ventricular atrial blanking. So we want the far field R wave signal to fall in the PVAB. So what we can, and this is the early part of the post ventricular atrial refractive period is called PVAB when the atrial channel doesn't sense anything at all. So what we need to do is we should be, we should measure from the V pace to the V sense. And that interval in this example, see it's around 68 milliseconds. So we have to program our PVAB that is post ventricular atrial refractive more than that and that will solve the problem. But it is very important to take care at the time of implantation that we should not see the ventricular signal at all in the atrial channel. Uh, the second way to solve this problem is if we have the atrial signal taller than the ventricular signal and the, and the sensitivity setting is quite high so that both are being sensed, we can reduce the sensitivity by programming a higher millivolt value and that will allow us to sense only atrial signal and the ventricular signal will not be sensed so the count will be will not be doubled so that can be another way but sometimes what happens is that both are of same uh, amplitude or sometimes even ventricular signal may be taller then this will not work so in a rare situation we may even have to replace or reposition the lead coming to the third case now we have a 55 year old gentleman with complete heart block who was implanted with a dual chamber pacemaker a few months back. And during the pacemaker follow-up, the patient complains that he feels palpitation quite frequently uh, for a couple of months. Uh, no pass history of palpitation. The patient is very upset and, and he says, Ki, you might better remove the, this thing. I'm feeling very uncomfortable. And when you interrogate, this is what you see. Uh, so what are we dealing with here? Is it... Uh, automatic mode switch or V pacing at the upper tracking rate or ventricular tachycardia causing palpitation. Or there is some other pacemaker hardware malfunction that is causing the patient this problem. Excellent. So we have a divided opinion here. Some people feel it's a pacemaker hardware, but uh, still the maximum people have called B, which is V pacing at upper tracking rate. Some people feel it is ventricular tachycardia. So we have a mixed response here. The correct answer is V pacing at upper tracking rate, because if we focus our attention to the atrial channel, we can see that the patient is in atrial fibrillation. We can see the fast irregular atrial rate and the ventricular rate is obviously slower. Uh, there are two other points that we must pay our attention to. One, of course, beside the atrial channel, one is that the pacemaker is pacing at about 141, which is the same as the maximum tracking rate. So these, this is the important point. We must see what is the upper tracking rate and what is the uh, pacing rate. It is not VT certainly because what we see here in the, is on the marker channel, we see all V pace. 
so it is in vt it would be vs that is v sense here it is v pace so it is a paced rhythm that much is certain and uh, we also see that the automatic mode switch is off here so obviously the pacemaker is not able to detect atrial fibrillation as a tachycardia and is not causing a mode switch because uh, it's, uh, it's not, uh, so that is not happening. Sorry about that. So the pacemaker is not uh, changing to the mode because the mode switch is switched off. So uh, as Dr. Ma has already explained that uh, when the mode switch is on, automatic mode switch is on, the pacemaker will change the mode to a non-tracking mode. Dr. Sadbir had asked a question about the automatic mode switch as to how this works. So the DDD and VDD and DDDR, they are all tracking modes. That is the pacemaker will sense in the atrium and pace in the ventricle. The non-tracking mode is the, when the third letter shows only inhibited. Uh, in, in normally when the third letter is D, that means that pacemaker has a dual uh, sensing, dual trigger mode. So it is atrial inhibited uh, and, and ventricular triggered. So whenever there is a, a sense, it will trigger a pace in the ventricle, but in the DDI or VVI, it will not do so. So we can change the pacemaker to a non-tracking mode during atrial tachycardia that will not allow unconditional tracking of the atrium and the heart rate will not increase during tachycardia. So this, this happens automatically in the pacemakers. So uh, this is what's happening in the patient that there is a atrial fibrillation going on and we have uh, very fast tracking by the pacemaker. So what is automatic mode switching? It is basically the ability of the pacemaker to automatically switch from one mode to another in response to a sense atrial tachyarrhythmia. And when we want to program this, we have to program two things. One, we have to program an AT detection rate. That is at what rate the pacemaker will implement the mode switch. And second, we want to decide on what non-tracking mode we want. Usually in a dual chamber, it's a DDIR or tracking mode where the pacemaker will not track, but will maintain adequate heart rate uh, during activity. Coming to the next case, we have a 60-year-old lady with 6 anus syndrome who was implanted a dual chamber pacemaker two years back. Recently, she was admitted for ischemic heart disease and had two stents placed. Uh, now, in the pacemaker clinic, she complained that she keeps feeling palpitations since she was, uh, she was discharged. For the last few months, she has been having palpitations. And when you do the interrogation, uh, this is what happens by chance that you have when you're interrogating the, and the monitor is on, this is what you see, that there is a, the heart rate suddenly increases and the patient complains of palpitations. She says, this is what I have. And uh, so what is this that we are dealing with? Is it a pacemaker mediated uh, problem or, or tachycardia or it's an induction of ventricular tachycardia or there is a rate drop response or ventricular safety pacing? Excellent, so that was an easy one, 90% uh, correct response. So it's a, a definitely a pacemaker mediated tachycardia. Dr. Ma explained it so beautifully that uh, sometimes the pacemaker starts behaving like a re-entrant circuit itself. And uh, this happens uh, typically with a ventricular ectopic beat. So what we have is a, in the very sense amplifier, you can see there is a ventricular premature beat which gets conducted retrogradely, and you can see there is a sense here, which then gets, it starts a AV delay, and the patient gets a V pace, that again gets uh, transmitted back to the atrium. So there is a continuous A sense V pace at a very fast rate. So that is the pacemaker mediated tachycardia, and typically it happens, it can happen in several situations, ventricular premature beat is one of them. And we can see the same thing, that's how it was happening in this lady, that there is a, a rhythm going on. And the lady gets a VPC here, and that initiates the 
pacemaker mediated tachycardia. So we can see it here. You can see on the screen capture that uh, there is a, uh, we can scroll it back and we can see that there is a, a ventricular premature beat here that initiates the tachycardia because of retrograde VA conduction. Now retrograde VA conduction is very, very necessary for this thing to happen. And as uh, Dr. Ma showed this thing, it's an animation here. It's an animation and we can see that a VPC gets transmitted back into the atrium and then it gets uh, transmitted back into the ventricle producing a re-entrant circuit and that leads to continuous tachycardia. So uh, it the rate will depend on the retrograde conduction time on the programmed AV interval and to, to prevent it, we have to program the P warp longer as uh, was told uh, by, Dr. by Dr. Ma. And the pacemakers now have an algorithm which uh, gives an extension of P warp in response to a PVC, which is called P warp extension. So every time the <clears throat> pacemaker senses a, a uh, PVC, it can do one of the two things. It can either give a P-warp extension or it can A pace on PVC. And to treat also, it can either give A pace on PMT, that is pacemaker mediated tachycardia, or it can give a P-warp extension. So uh, this is how you program it. There is a PMT response, which you can program to whatever you want, A pace or P-warp extension. And the PVC also you can program to A pace or PVC extension. And that's how it works. So when the patient is having, uh, this is during PMT, uh, patient is having PMT, and if the pacemaker, is after a certain number of counted intervals, uh, the pacemaker makes a diagnosis that it's a PMT uh, going on, and the pacemaker, instead of giving a, on sensing a atrium, instead of giving a ventricular pace, it gives a atrial pace, and that restores the normal rhythm. So uh, it, that's how it can work. And the PVC response also, in response to a PVC, uh, despite if it is retrogradely conducted, but instead of giving a V pace, the pacemaker gives a A pace here. So this algorithm, as soon as the pacemaker detects a ventricular premature beat, which is defined as absence of atrial activity before that. So if there is a ventricular activity without any atrial activity, before that it is counted as a PVC. And in response to that, instead of giving a A uh, if it is retrogradely conducted, instead of causing a V pace, it does it, what it does is a A pace, and that prevents induction of the tachycardia. Coming to case five. Now, this is a 45 year old lady with six anus syndrome who was implanted a dual chamber pacemaker five years back. The patient complains of mild palpitations on and off, and during a pacemaker follow up, the device was interrogated. And this is what we observe. So what are we dealing with? Is it AT causing automatic mode switch? Is it uh, some other atrial rhythm by Gemini or far field R wave sensing or atrial under sensing? What are we dealing with here? So the opinion is uh, again divided. Some people feel it is eating causing AMS, and but still the largest number have replied the correct answer that is atrial under sensing. And I will show you why it is atrial under sensing. <clears throat> so again, we focus our attention to the atrial channel. The patient is having atrial fibrillation, uh, but the atrial marker channel is not showing that. So. Uh, if it was showing atrial fibrillation, we would see a lot of AR, AR, AS, AR. The upper channel is full of ASAR. If we properly sense, if the pacemaker properly senses atrial fibrillation. And in fact, this lack of sensing is, is, is preventing uh, the mode switch. Uh, so that is a problem. This is atrial under sensing of the atrial fibrillation. If we look at the, and, and that also causes one more problem which is PVC 
response, the PVC count is being shown as 44%. Now, this may not be so because if, as I told you earlier, if there is a V sense without any atrial activity, it will be counted as PVC. So because the atrial channel is not showing any sensing, the pacemaker senses all these as a PVC. So the PVC counts becomes high. So that's another problem. Now that's the video of the, this patient. And we can see that uh, the rhythm that is going on is uh, atrial fibrillation as shown in the atrial channel. So what do we do? We want to measure the P wave here and we start the atrial sense test. But the problem is that if you start atrial sense test, like, just like that in the automatic mode, it will start from the currently programmed sensitivity, which was 0.75. So it will, it's not sensing any P wave because the starting sensitivity was too low. So what we do is we stop the test and then we have to start the test again. We go to the manual mode here and we change the sensitivity settings. We need to change it to say from, this was the nominal 0.75 programmed. We change it to 0.2 and we start the test again in the manual mode. And now you can see that the, it is sensing the AS, AR, that's how it should be all the time. So the pace, we can see the eight marker channel, you can see all and then AMS is also happening. And the test was started at 0.2 millivolt. And now we can see what is the exact amplitude of the, a, of the P waves during atrial fibrillation. And then we can program this sensitivity accordingly. So in this example, it was around 0 0.3 or 0.4. And the sensitivity setting has been then changed. So yeah, at 0.5, the sensitivity sensing was lost. So it was 0.4. So we changed the, this thing to 0.2 and we program it. And uh, that's how it works. So programming is complete and the patient will then have proper sensing and automatic mode switch. Now there is another uh, uh, feature in some pacemakers uh, in, in Abbott, they have it, sensibility, which is, which works, which is like a dynamic sensitivity as you see in the implantable defibrillators. So the, the value that we program is maximum sensitivity and it does an auto adjustment of sensitivity during the cardiac cycle. So it prevents oversensing also and it doesn't fail to sense the atrial fibrillation because it keeps on changing the sensitivity during the cardiac cycle. Whenever it senses the atrial signal, it will lower the sensitivity, which will gradually increase and then it will be ready for sensing the next atrial, next P wave. So that's something very, very interesting. So the answer is that it was atrial under sensing because of uh, uh, atrial fibrillation uh, not being sensed and by increasing the sensitivity we can solve. And this is the picture showing, which I already mentioned that if there is a uh, ventricle activity without any preceding A sense or A pace, then it is counted as a PVC. And the cause of under sensing could be poor intrinsic signal. It could be deterioration of the intrinsic signal. It could be component malfunction. It could be some disease process happening in the atrium, which has reduced the electrogram amplitude. So now we come to the last case, which is uh, a 52 year old gentleman who was implanted a dual chamber pacemaker for symptomatic bradycardia. The patient complains of continued shortness of breath when doing exercise. So this was the initial problem with the patient that patient had very symptomatic bradycardia. He used to have uh, fatigue and tiredness and shortness of breath. But even after pacemaker, the patient says that he is not benefited much. There is some improvement, but not much. So he comes after six months and when you interrogate, this is what the rate histogram shows. So can any programming help him? What will you like to do? Will you like to program the automatic mode switch on or you want to increase the lower rate or you want to make some changes to sensor parameter or you want to increase the postventricular atrial refractive period? Uh, can we activate the poll, please? <laughs> 
Excellent. So uh, a lot of them uh, of you have cho chosen the choice C that is changing the sensor parameters, which is actually the correct choice because what we see here is that the these are this is a rate histogram and in rate histogram there are different bins so you have a 50 to 60 bins 60 to 70 bin 70 to 80 80 to 90 90 to 100 so what we see that most of the heart rate is in the 60 to 70 range uh, which is not uh, very good because when the patient exercises the heart rate should go up and that's how a good uh, rate histogram would look like that the every rate interval is binned into a particular bin so uh, we can see that there is a very good distribution of uh, cardiac cycle intervals uh, in this histogram so the heart rate is rising appropriately during exercise and that's how a good histogram should look like and what we have in this patient is a very very flat histogram that is the heart rate most of the time is at the lower pacing rate so uh, the pacemakers have different kind of sensors. Uh, there were activity sensors, which still are the most widely used and could be vibration sensor, which is a piezoelectric crystal, or it could be accelerometer, which senses the acceleration. And then there are physiological sensors, which sense the minute ventilation or temperature or revoked response, QT interval or CLS. What we have in use are vibration sensors. Piezoelectric is still rarely used, but what we have most commonly used is accelerometer today and minute ventilation and some pacemakers use CLS as well. So this is piezoelectric crystal, which is inside the body and it senses the vibration when the muscle activity or the body activity takes place. This is accelerometer, which senses the movement of the body. And then we have minute ventilations also used commonly in some patients, some pacemakers which measures the impedance between the pacemaker body and the lead tip. So thoracic impedance. So what happens is it can count the respiratory rate. You see in, in ICUs, the monitors can count the respiratory rate and that is by measuring the phasic changes in the, minute, in the thoracic impedance. And the same technology can be used by the pacemaker to count the respiratory rate. And so when you exercise, the respiratory rate will, will go up and the pacemaker can increase the heart rate commensurately. So, and many pacemakers have a blended pacemaker. So you have pacemakers which have minute ventilation and accelerometer combined. Because the problem is that when the accelerometer, when the activity stops, the accelerometer will automatically rapidly decrease it. But the minute ventilation will allow the pacemaker to continue uh, heart rate activity. So there are several pace parameters that can be programmed in the, in the sensors. It could be base rate, maximum sensor rate, threshold, slope, reaction time, recovery time. The maximum sensor rate has to be programmed carefully because we don't want very high rate in everybody. In younger individuals, we may want a higher rate, but in older individuals and especially in patients who have a cardiac disease like coronary heart disease, we don't want the heart rate to rise too much. So we program maximum sensor detection rate accordingly. Then the threshold is the threshold activity at which we want the rate response to kick in. So we may want a low activity, medium activity, or high activity when we want the sense response to kick in. Then the, it can be made very aggressive or more muted. So in our patient that we discussed in the beginning, the response is very muted. So we can, want, we can select a better slope so that the response is more aggressive. So for the same level of activity, we can have a muted response or we can have a more aggressive response. So that's how we program it. This is the patient who came with a flat heart rate of 60. And we can go to the parameter setting. Then we go to the sensor. It was in passive mode. We can switch it on and we can program the maximum sensor rate. We can check the threshold as what we want. We can program the uh, so the programming is done and the patient's problem will be solved. So as I said, we must uh, like take into account the patient's age and lifestyle, the left ventricular function, and especially coronary heart disease to program it. And when the patient comes subsequently for the, for the follow-up, this is what we see that the heart rate has, it picks up during exercise and the patient was feeling much, much better. So I think I will stop here. If there is a, any questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Thank you so much. Thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sasena, for sharing with us uh, six simulation cases, which may come across uh, in pacemaker clinic. Uh, 
Uh, Professor Hua, do you have any additional information you want to share with us? Yes, uh, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Cecina. It gave an uh, excellent talk about uh, troubleshooting. This is uh, very important for clinical practice. Uh, I think it's, uh, the some uh, contents is uh, overlap with the Dr. Ma's contents. I think that there is uh, some question we can answer here for both speakers. And uh, uh, <coughs> let me uh, ask a question for uh, the audience. Uh, there is uh, questions about, uh, uh, please explain about the tracing have a DDI model. Maybe Dr. Sassina, you can answer this question. Yeah, can I have the question again, please? Please explain about the tracing have a DDI model. DDI, yeah. So uh, I can go back to the case. Uh, DDI, so we know the uh, meaning of these letters. We know that the first letter represents the chamber that is paced. So in a dual chamber, DDD or DDI, the first letter indicates that both chambers are paced. The second letter is also D, which indicates that both chambers are sensed. And so, and the third letter in a D means it's a dual response. So when the pacemaker senses a, a atrial signal, it will inhibit the atrial pacing and, but it will trigger a ventricular pacing. So that's called DDI response. So when we have a DDD, which means that both chambers are paced and then both chambers are sensed as well. And D, third letter D means a dual response that atrial inhibited ventricular trigger. So when it senses a atrial signal, it will inhibit pacing in the atrium and it triggers pacing in the ventricle. In a DDI mode, it, will, it means that it will just inhibit, it will not trigger any pacing in the ventricle. So it, so the rate will be what, whatever is the low rate programmed. And when the patient does activity, the rate will increase accordingly. So even if patient is having atrial fibrillation, patient will pace in the, at the lower rate of 60, if we have programmed 60. And uh, when the patient does activity, it will gradually increase it to 65, 70, 75, 80, whatever. So that is the meaning of DDI. It's a non-tracking mode. And DDD is a tracking mode. That is, it tracks the atrial activity and paces the ventricle. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, there is uh, an, another question. I maybe ask uh, Dr. Ma to answer this question. The okay. question is uh, why there is a blanking and a refractor period. Is any one not enough? Dr. Okay. Ma, please. To put it uh, in a simple terms, Refractory period is a big Venn diagram and blanking is part of it. So blanking, as I explained, is to prevent the sensor from being oversaturated and for, for, to prevent the sensor from picking up unwanted signals. So the blanking period is very short, but the bigger one, the refractory period, is actually what follows that. The refractory period is designed to prevent crosstalk and also sensing in the same chamber in ventricle level, um, particularly the T wave. So if you think about that, you just think about refractory period, but in the beginning of it, which is part of refractory period, we call it blanking. It's just like they are, they are, they are, they are the first, the, the different name for the, for, the, for the same thing, the beginning and also the bigger one. So remember, blanking period is part of refractory period. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, now I think we should move to the uh, last speaker, uh, Dr. Kevin Chan. Uh, Dr. Chan is a consultant <coughs> with the Department of Cardiology at the National Heart Center Singapore and the adjunct assistant professor at Duke uh, NUS Medical School. He specialized in arrhythmia care in the field of the electrophysiology and the pacing with a key interest in sudden cardiac death, cryoablation, ventricular tachycardia, fluorosless ablation procedure, and the lead extraction. Dr. Cha completed his clinical fellow up in, in, in cardiac electrophysiology at the Cisana Medical Center, United States from 2015 to 2016, and the University of Chicago, United States from uh, 
2016 to 2017, where he acquired expert in the management of a complex arrhythmia and a cardiac implantable electro device. Today, he's going to talk about uh, MR safe pacemaker. Please, Chair, please. Dr. Chai? Yep. Okay, please. Thank you. I'm going to let me uh, share my screen. Thank you for the introduction. And this talk is uh, in collaboration with uh, APHRS as well as supported by Abbott. I thank you for the invitation. In my talk today, I'm tasked uh, to talk to you about MRI for patients with uh, cardiac implantable electronic devices. And of course, we're talking about pacemakers, ICDs, and CRTs. So today's talk, I'll be touching on a few things. I'll be talking to you about the background of why we need to talk about this topic at all. Some of the definitions so that we have a common language about this topic. I'll also be sharing some key MRI technology and how it influences our uh, devices technology and makes what makes their interactions unique. I will then discuss a workflow on the management of these patients who require an MRI. And um, I'll also be uh, talking a lot on the uh, uh, consensus statement recommendations and uh, I'll give a summary at the end of my talk. <clears throat> now this is a uh, fairly old data, but it estimates that 8 million people worldwide have non-conditional uh, cardiac implantable electronic devices. And um, MRI is rapidly becoming a primary tool in evaluating the central nervous system, musculoskeletal disorders, tumors, and some cardiac disorders as well, such that MRI utilization has increased dramatically in recent years, as you can see on this graph on the left. The combination of this two growing phenomenon results in an estimated 50 to 75 probability that a patient would require an MRI over the lifetime of the device. So some of the definitions that we'll be using today, just to make sure we get uh, this straight, that there is no cardiac device that can be labeled as MRI safe. MR safe labeling requires this object to be of absolutely no hazard in any MR environment. An example would probably be plastic objects. An MR conditional device would have been an object that's been tested in a specific MR environment with specified conditions that has been proven not to pose any hazards. <coughs> Excuse me. This often requires a combination, uh, uh, combined knowledge of uh, the MR factors and uh, our device's lead and generation uh, generator specifications. And of course, an MR non-conditional system would include any devices other than those meeting the MR conditional labeling. So what makes the MRI special with regards to uh, our devices? First of all, MRI has three main fields that is being used for scanning. There's a static magnetic field, Often this is the one that you hear radiographers or physicians talking about whether you're using a three uh, a Tesla MRI machine, a 1.5 Tesla, this is the strength of the MRI. And this does, what this does is it aligns the protons with or against the magnetic field. And through this uh, static magnetic field, a pulse radio frequency uh, waves will be released to excite the nuclear spin of the proton. And this causes an energy transition which is then detected in the scanners. There are also, there's also a magnetic gradient field that serve to localize in space the signal that is emitted after this regular frequency signal is turned off. So various contrasts through these three different fields can be generated between tissues by varying pulse RF sequences. And this all is based on uh, the physics of the relaxation properties of the hydrogen nuclei. Of course, we're not gonna touch on the MRI physics, I am not an MRI physician, but it suffice to say that these three fields alone or in combination can potentially influence the performance of our sensitive uh, electronic components. So what does MRI do or interact with our devices? The next two slides I'll be talking about some of the potential interactions. The first one is movement. 
the magnetic fields can actually induce a force and torque due to the presence of ferromagnetic materials. However, our generator's uh, movement is extremely unlikely due to its confinement in subcutaneous tissues. Mostly, it's almost all leads do not contain any significant ferromagnetic materials to cause movement. Radiant magnetic fields can induce electrical current in conductive wires leading to myocardial capture. And this can potentially lead to atrial or ventricular arrhythmias. Radio frequency fields can also lead to non-conditional devices component heating and subsequent thermal damage to surrounding tissues, much like a functional ablation. This local tissue thermal damage can also lead to changes in sensing or capture thresholds. The read switch, the read switch uh, is something that is used by the device for programming by a placing placement of a magnet. The magnetic fields can affect the read switch activity, especially on a non-conditional uh, device leading to asynchronous pacing and inhibition of tachycardia therapies. There can also be electrical resets because high energy electromagnetic interference, what we call EMI, can lead to a electrical or power on reset where pacing might be inhibited and tachyarrhythmia therapies activated. These parameters vary by vendor and type of device. An EMI can also be oversensed and lead to inappropriate inhibition of demand pacing. And this can potentially lead to possible asystole in patients who are pacing dependent. In ICDs, this oversensed activity can be regarded by the device as BTVF and trigger inappropriate tachyarrhythmia therapies. In addition, battery status can be affected, particularly for devices that are near ERI, and this can result in unreliable function of the device. So what about the other way, the device interactions with MRI? Device on the flip side can also, cause interact, can also interact with the MRI to cause image distortion due to the metal composition. Devices and leads can alter the local magnetic field, which causes misreading of the correct localization of the proton signal by the MR scanner. <coughs> this results in various types of artifacts within the MRI, and typically, and these are image distortions, signal loss within the image slices that contain or neighbor the device. So it's difficult to predict these artifacts in advance because there are multiple potential variables. But wide band filtering algorithms have been developed. And uh, in the recent years, they serve to attenuate these artifacts and enhance image quality in the vicinity of a cardiac device. This picture is taken from one of our mentors, a publication in Heart Rhythm. Uh, together with uh, MR physicists, I think this group from UCLA developed a wide band late getting enhancement MRI sequence, which effectively reduced the artifact created by the ICD. In this paper, I think they elegantly uh, uh, correlated MR scar with an electroanatomical mapping scar, and they were able to match the scar and demonstrate MRI correlation. And if you see at the left-sided image where the ICD has been planted, sometimes that causes image distortion. There may be signal loss, and this complicates the assessment of scar in MRIs. So we've talked about the three types of magnetic fields, how it can uh, alone or in combination adversely affect the device. These uh, forces can lead to a potential for device movement, excessive heating, electrical current induction, EMI, the read switch behavior we talked about, the power on reset, and even the potentially battery depletion. So rendering a device to be MRI conditional actually requires the leads and generators to be specifically tested together. That's very important for the audience out there. If you have uh, a device and two leads and only one of them is MR conditional and they were not tested together in the system, this system is still MR non-conditional. <clears throat> 
So for the leads, the two main challenges are to minimize the heating at the tip and to reduce the antenna effect. The heating at the tip can cause myocardial damage, pain, changes in pacing, sensing function, while the antenna effect picks up resonant frequency and causes electric current to conduct and possibly myocardial capture, and that can induce arrhythmias. The generator, on the other hand, faces maybe more challenges. Manufacturers have to reduce the ferromagnetic content to decrease magnetic attraction and imaging artifacts. The replacement of read switches with solid state hall effect sensors, which behave more predictably in an MRI environment. Shielding with uh, special filters limits the transfer of certain frequencies and dissipates energy and thereby reduces the risk of uh, potential damage to the circuitry. Certain devices also have MRI mode, which also features uh, a pre-scan uh, system integrity checks. It is synchronous pacing, non-sensing modes, disabling of tachycardia and detection, increasing the uh, output transiting during the scan and restoration of pre-scan program states and values. So many companies have this. You should uh, talk to your uh, uh, device representative. MRI modes are easily programmable. So let's talk about the leads. Uh, most pacing leads are coaxial in design. They have an uh, inner and outer installation and an inner and outer core delivery while maintaining flexibility and durability. The inner coils are wound three-dimensionally with a certain pitch or angle. Changing the geometry of this relationships by altering the number of filers or winding turns can change the propensity of the lead to act as an antenna or likelihood of an efficient lead tip heating. An alternative, you can see the second uh, picture is a cold radio design. Other changes to polarization, applying a heat dissipating filter or inductor to reduce electrode heating. These are all the technical details that the companies at the back end are trying to get leads uh, 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 to have less interactions from the MRI. So this is a list of FDA approved MR conditional devices. Of course, uh, this list is outdated. I think this was probably compiled three years ago, but every company should have their own MR conditional devices, including uh, loop recorders, other special devices, including leadless uh, pacemakers and subcutaneous ICDs are also included in this list. Like for example, the uh, 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 for example, if we see the Abbott and the Sanju medical devices, you see that there's uh, uh, no high voltage devices listed here. But actually, if you check with them, they've all been uh, uh, MR conditional. There are newer range of uh, ICDs and CRTs, including those from the uh, LIPS Quadra series, are all approved for 1.5 Tesla full body MRI. And also, uh, uh, likewise for Boston Scientific, you see that there's only the uh, 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 subcutaneous ICD listed here. Uh, but uh, actually, the newer uh, series like Dynagen, Enogen, Charisma, they're all approved for 1.5 Tesla uh, full body MRI as well. So this is a list uh, for 1.5 Tesla MRI. If you're planning for a 3 Tesla MRI, it gets a little trickier. Some devices have a thoracic a zone exclusion. I think uh, uh, um, it is uh, uh, not appropriate to go through every device in this forum. I would advise maybe a quick phone call to your local uh, device representative to check. So numerous trials have been published for MR conditional devices. There's at least two prospective multi-center randomized control trials and three prospective uh, multi-center cohort studies demonstrating safety and efficacy of MRI in conditional devices. The latest trials no longer have any zone restrictions. You can do them in your thorax. And just note that they were mostly done on uh, 1.5 Tesla MRIs and they had minimal to no adverse effects uh, post-MRI. So this is the workflow of protocol. I, I, I took it from the uh, HRS uh, consensus statement on uh, devices, uh, uh, patients who are requiring MRI. I apologies uh, for the small fonts, but uh, first you check if the MRI uh, if the system is MR conditional. If yes, if the time of implant beyond the exam period for conditionality, which is often universally accepted as six weeks. Maybe we can talk about that, but uh, 
oftentimes the six weeks was uh, kind of agreed between the companies, but uh, when they started the trials, they were uh, uh, trying to avoid the, comp uh, the possibility that a lead dislodgement usually occurs within six weeks and they did not do they could not differentiate that within whether it was a result of the MRI or the lead actual dislodged by itself. So they put an arbitrary number of six weeks. But even if it is not beyond six weeks, this consensus statement gives a 2A recommendation that we can still perform an MRI if clinically indicated. If the de device is well beyond six weeks, then we can pro proceed with MRI as planned under a standardized uh, protocol, which includes uh, pre and post checks, appropriate uh, uh, programming, continuous ECG monitoring, oximetry during the MRI, and having personnel to be trained for ACLS in the MRI room, keeping the external defeat nearby and the programmer nearby. And so, if the MR, if the device is MR non conditional, the consensus statement gives a 2A recommendation, as you can see highlighted in yellow here, uh, provided there are no fractured leads, abandoned leads, or epicardial leads. And MRI is considered the best imaging modality for this patient, after which actually the workflow is roughly similar for all the patients requiring an MRI. So numerous prospective studies and registries have also examined the risk of clinically indicated MRI for patients with MR non-conditional devices and have overall reported successful MRI scanning without clinically significant changes in the device function or patient harm. A standardized collaborative institution policy should be developed to clearly identify inclusion exclusion criteria as well as uh, personal, personnel responsibilities and workflow. Due to the risk of lead heating and in some cases the inability to accurately assess the electrical properties of the lead prior to MRI, fractured leads, epicardial leads and abandoned leads have been excluded from these registries and most single center studies. Hence, we do not do an MRI for these patients. The MagnaSafe registry is probably worth mentioning it included MR non-conditional devices. I think there were 1,500 devices and underwent clinically indicated non-thoracic MRI. Very importantly, there were no deaths, no lead failures, uh, 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 loss of capture, nor any ventricular arrhythmias that occurred during the MRI. Maybe one ICD could not be interrogated after the MRI and required immediate, re immediate replacement. And it was mentioned that the device maybe were not, was not appropriately programmed per protocol before the MRI. There were six cases of self-terminating atrial fibrillation or flutter, and there were six cases of partial electrical reset. And changes in impedance, thresholds, voltage, uh, uh, sensing of P-wave and R-wave did not exceed the pre-specified uh, 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 threshold. And it was in a small number of cases between a range of 0.2 to 0.9. The consensus statement also gives a 2A recommendation to perform an MRI scan immediately after implantation of a lead or generator, which is MR non-conditional. And this is, uh, our, our emphasis is if clinically warranted. And it's also reasonable to repeat MRI without any restriction on a minimal interval in between, because lead dislodgements are more likely to occur in the immediate post-implantation period. A six-week waiting period was adopted in clinical trials of MR non-conditional pacemakers to avoid confusion, is what I mentioned earlier. In a single center, prospective cohort of 170 patients that included eight patients with recently implanted devices, actually there was no difference in device function observed between patients scanned early or late after the implant. Importantly as well, in the MagnaSafe registry, there were 63 cases in which MRI was performed within 90 days of the implant, 17 of which was performed within 30 days. And there were also five cases which were done within seven days of implant. And there was no correlation between, lead, between changes in lead performance and from time of implantation. But this data serves to support the feasibility of MRI in patients with recently implanted devices. Studies that included patients with multiple MRI scans have not shown changes in device function as well. And this 
was why the consensus statement also gave a recommendation that is reasonable to perform repeat MRI if required without any minimal interval period between the two. So there's also, uh, there are also guidelines for monitoring of devices if there are significant changes in parameters post MRI. You need to know that these guidelines recommend that these parameters are like a pacing threshold of uh, change in uh, more than one volt. The sensing P wave for RF decreased by more than 50% from baseline. A pacing impedance of change of uh, 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 more than 50 ohms a shock impedance of uh, more than 5 ohms. Of course, uh, I think there may be a little bit of a, 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 a sometimes measurement changes, but these are the parameters that are given by the guidelines. So now the decision on MRI conditional system can be difficult at times, especially if cost in a is, a, is a concern in your institution. But if cost is not an issue, I believe all physicians would choose an MR conditional system. But I think the discussion is also with your institution to consider the downstream costs. If a patient has compromised care due to an inability to do an MRI, this would also be an intangible cost. But of course, some may argue that I've also already shown you that even if MR devices are MR non-conditional, they have largely found to be safe to do an MRI anyway. And so you may want, not want to spend the money on higher end devices. All this depends, I think, still on your institution, your MRI team, and whether they are willing to perform MRI uh, uh, in patients with non-conditional uh, devices. And of course, the, the next decision often comes when the patient turns up for the generator replacement. And I, I, I personally, uh, I rely on the, uh, looking, at the, looking at the existing leads. So if the existing leads are non-conditional, so even if you implant a conditional generator, the whole system is still considered non-conditional MR. But of course, some existing leads may gain MR conditional status, so that might be a consideration. But I believe at this stage, maybe no further legacy leads uh, are being tested uh, for MR uh, conditioning, I'm not sure. And I think there may be too many combinations out there that, uh, that uh, this is unlikely to yield uh, meaningful results from the company testing. And there's also a fair number of uh, 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 patients who, with dual chamber pacemaker, who subsequently develop AFib. I'm sure everyone would have some experience with that. And when these patients require generator replacements, physicians often ref uh, switch to a single chamber device and abandon or cap the atrial lead. But remember, bear in mind that this means that you would render the patient or the entire system MR non-conditional because you abandoned the atrial lead. And some people talk about an extraction, but uh, I think extraction is a relatively safe procedure in good hands. But uh, uh, if it's just to make a system MR conditional, I think the risks are not justified. So in my mind, uh, there are only three conditions where I would not do an MRI, and that's the presence of a fractured lead, an abandoned lead, or an epicardial lead. However, I think you should really discuss with your MRI team in your institution on their concerns and comfort level. The safest device systems for MRI would be those that have received MR conditional labeling. They are more than six weeks post-implant. These patients are not pacing dependent having low thresholds, not near ERI, and the MRI is performed in a non-thoracic zone at 1.5 Tesla and below. And of course, like I mentioned earlier, every company has their own latest range of devices which are conditional for three Tesla MRI. And of course, you can check with your local representative. So this is my last slide in summary. I hope that through this talk, we have gained a better understanding into MRI technology and the devices technology and how they can potentially interact with each other. We have appreciated through several studies how an MRI can be safely performed in device patients as long as you have established institutional workflow, taking into account some of the key caveats as I've mentioned. I've also shown you recommendations for MRI in non-conditional systems, and this might be something worth 
exploring for many institutions. With that, I thank you for your time and I also uh, invite the panel for any questions. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Cha. I think it's a very important issue in clinical practice because more and more patients uh, with uh, uh, pacemaker and also the need to MR uh, examination. So uh, I have a question for you and uh, because there's, uh, uh, you just mentioned, some uh, MR non-conditional device also can take MR examination. So uh, how to choose the device for the patients in your clinical practice? So honestly, uh, I would have to admit that even in my center alone, uh, 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 the MRI uh, uh, physicians have expressed extreme reluctance with regards to performing MRI for patients with non-conditional devices. So that's my number one uh, uh, um, consideration. If I'm not going to be able to get an MRI for my patients in the future, if and when they need it, I'm going to uh, 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 discuss with the patient. If cost is not the concern, I would usually push to implant the, a de novo patient with an MR uh, conditional device. Okay, uh, so I think his time is uh, already. So, uh, Mr. Yu, I think uh, we should uh, close the session. Uh, hey, uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor Pua, uh, as, a, as our chairperson, for leading today's uh, discussion. So, of course, uh, all our three speakers, Dr. Ma, Dr. Susina, and Dr. Kevin, uh, Kevin Chua, for your uh, effort in preparing for all this informative uh, lecture and sharing. And um, um, before um, um, we, we end, end of today, so I would like to um, just quickly uh, to share with you um, uh, in two weeks' time, so, um, we will have uh, the ICD uh, module uh, on 5th of September. Uh, there will be the APHRS ICD module and uh, come with a free topics again. And then uh, the part two will be on uh, 19th of uh, September. So for those who are in, interested to learn um, more about ICDs, please join us uh, and you can find uh, the information uh, from APHI, APHI's website and also uh, from our, co our effort colleagues. And, uh, and finally, I would like to invite um, Professor Hua again uh, to deliver in, uh, final remarks uh, for today's section. Thank you, Professor Hua. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, three speakers gave an excellent talk about uh, 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 troubleshooting and time cycle and also MRI conditional pacemaker. And also I think thank all the audience attendees a very, <coughs> very important uh, education program. Finally, I will thank uh, Albert to support this uh, uh, education program. So see you uh, next time in for uh, APHS uh, 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 webinar series. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Howie. Thank, 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 so Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Oh, of course, I'm